Now, the difference between the two monies is that all bank-issued money has to be repaid as debt uh, and with interest, whereas the state money is issued free of charge at the point of issue, but is taxed to make it circulate, otherwise it wouldn't circulate. The debt money must circulate because people have got to pay their debts back. So they've got to do something to be able to pay their debts back. So, so there's two money circuits. One is the state tax money circuit, which has now been eclipsed. And then there's the bank repayment money circuit. And there's two money circuits. But we're all, we're totally committed now to the bank repayment money circuit. And we haven't got hardly any space for the state taxation money circuit. Um, so that would explain uh, so, and that, and we know now, we, we will accept that the national money supply is now uh, based uh, uh, on bank issued debt, and, and that's what's subject to crisis. We speak of going to crisis. Now, the, the thing got interconnected when the banks didn't issue their own notes of credit, which was only the banks would stand guarantee for. They issued, the, uh, they came together and they started issuing the national currency. And this, I think, is what hasn't been pointed out today, in a sense. But that is why you can't separate the public and the private. Because unless banks go back to issuing their own money, which they're responsible for, as long as they are issuing the national currency, which by law must be acknowledged and honoured by anybody to whom it is offered, then that must become the responsibility of the society as a whole, honouring it. And that falls on the, the, the instrument of society as a whole, which is the state. So if you've got a national currency and your banks are issuing national currency, it doesn't matter whether there's electronic records, doesn't matter whether it's coin, so whether you swap it over, or that doesn't matter. If it's been designated in the national currency, it will have to be publicly honoured. Otherwise, you don't have a money system, you don't have, you don't have a means of circulation. But what has happened now is that as money's been privatised, the state can no longer have it, its money circuit. The only money circuit it's got is the, uh, is the bank one, and therefore the state is now borrowing money. Uh, and, 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 and the only way it can raise its money um, is by, by taxation of bank-issued money. So it's starting to have to use tax as real access to money, as opposed to a, a monetary circuit. It, the tax now is having to let the banking system up get the money out, circulate it wherever it chooses to go into a highly inflated um, house prices or whatever it is, and then hopefully at the end of the line to tax it back to get it in, and what it can't tax it borrows. Um, so they have to borrow, and therefore obviously you end up with a national debt, and you end up with deficit. Now, as bank money must be repaid with interest, the money supply must continually expand, so you must have a way of getting more money in the system if there's an interest base, because it has to come from somewhere. And we do know, you've had these figures before, about how much was linked to property. I've got 75%, but I mean, yeah, these are estimates. But the most important thing is just how much of the money that was let out went to the financial sector itself, really to gain, engage in financial speculation, of which obviously a fair proportion would be linked to property. Um, according to um, uh, Will Hatton in the Channel 4 dispatches we did just uh, a few months ago, 50% of bank loans went to individuals, mainly in mortgages, 3% went to manufacturing, 3%, this is before the crisis, 17% to non-financial businesses, and 30% to financial businesses. So that's where the money... So of course they can get rich. If you've got the money tax, and you're issuing about a third of it to yourselves, then you're going to get remarkably rich. Uh, and of course then that led them... And then of course they didn't know what to do with all this money. They got That's why you got subprime. Because they didn't know what to do with all this money they could access. And down the line and down the line they went. The consequences we know. Uh, we know about the debt. We know about all these things. But the inequality. Come to that last point at the bottom. That's jo uh, Joseph Stiglitz's figures. He says that unlike the kind of 400 to 1, which is bad enough of, of, of CEOs and, and average wages, the top, the top owners in the financial sector, 19,000 times average income as an annual income, 19,000 times. I mean, that's unbelievable. Quote from about uh, how banks uh, create money is so simple, the mind is just hell. I think a lot of people know that uh, know that quote, and we've talked a lot about it, so I won't go into that anymore. But, um, so as I've said, money has to be created issued. It doesn't appear in society. Um, 
And I think I've said most of these. Yeah, the important thing to think is not deposits that create loans. Fractional reserve banking doesn't actually work like that. It, that, that, that that's a myth that the loans are lent out. It's that the deposits are made through loans. You, unless you unless you create the money and issue it into the system, how can anybody deposit what hasn't been created? So if you take it back to its first point, it is the loan that creates the deposit and not the deposit that creates the loan. So we've kind of in that sense we've misunderstood fractional reserve banking, we've misunderstood what it is. Um, and uh, therefore, and of course, if the banks are creating the deposit in the national currency, they cannot help but become a public responsibility. They can't help it. That is how it's going to be. So the public sector is seen, and because we've now given over money creation to the private sector, we know it's the public sector that's seen as parasitic. We, the public sector is seen as, as leeching on these clever people who are issuing money to themselves and finding nothing seriously and sensible to do with it. Um, but it's totally the opposite. It is the, the private sector, particularly the financial sector, as the previous speakers have been pointed out, that leech on the public sector. That leech on the public sector. And in the end, the only thing you've got is public rescue. In the only the only thing you've got is our trust in each other and our trust in our money system and our trust in the security we've got. Um, Private finance, in fact, because it, it claims that it is making the money, which it is, quite literally, making the money, it, av it, it avoids public responsibility. Uh, Robert Preston, in his book, he says that the thing that surprised him when he interviewed these people, earning you know, huge amounts of money in the city, how totally unwilling they were to pay tax. Totally unwilling to pay tax. And yet it's the tax system that has to bail them out. It doesn't care about fairness, hence the 19,000 to 1. It doesn't care and avoids tax. So we have to reclaim money. If people printed coins like they're issuing bank credit, you would arrest them for counterfeiting. It would be against the law. And certainly financial speculators should not have access to money issues. Um, this, this point has been well made in the last speakers. If you put your money in, uh, but even, the, even then, I think they're still talking about a system that is borrowing short to lend long. <laughs> I think the business model, as we've had put up before, still wouldn't work. Because if you want your money back in a month, how are they going to tie them up with somebody else who wants the money for a month? It, doesn't, it won't work like that. Um, and therefore, you would still be borrowing short to lend long. So it's not just the, the, the credit issue in terms of fractional reserve or whatever, whatever form you think it's taking. It's also to do with the business model won't work, even if you totally make it 100% deposit. The business model will not work. Because the investment and the money should have the same maturity date, and you won't be able to do that. Okay. Um, and certainly, I think people, I do agree though, segregation and that money should be put safely in non commercial organisations. Therefore, I think money isn't secured by the market, it's secured by the capacity of states themselves as an economic community. I think I've said this. I think money issues should be public and under public control in some way. Money should be seen as a commons resource like air or water um, is a natural resource. And the one thing we haven't heard about in the previous talks about the money system is fair access to money. We haven't heard that at all. And it's proper use. And of course there's fair access to property and fair access to resources and fair access. I mean there's a lot more fairness we need to talk about. But we need fair access to money and, and it's proper use. We need to know it's being put to proper use. And we need to re therefore reclaim money as a debt-free public resource with democratically determined priorities. There's many ways you could do this. The idea of just giving it to a state to spend, I think, I don't think that would be sensible. But I think there's many ways of issuing it, citizens' income, paying pensions out of directly um, um, issued money, um, uh, giving it to firms to invest. Um, perfectly possible. Uh, going out through cooperatives, going out through mutuals. No, no, no problem there. And, and taxation used. To, uh, to, to, to manage the money supply. So, so, to, so I get fiscal and monetary completely the other way around. And what I'm looking to, my end line here, is to create a sufficiency economy. Create an economy where we get what we need, but not more than, not more than we need, to have a good quality of life. And that's what I want to achieve, and that's what my, my book is about. Reclaiming money as a public resource. Then we would prioritise socially necessary expenditure first and democratic priorities 
for expenditure and investment. At the moment, the money is issued who knows where to do who knows what, and we have to kind of then borrow and plead to get it back for public services. It shouldn't be that way around. It should be public services first, and let the private sector show it is meeting social needs. And if private sector can meet social needs, then let it have the business. I'm not, I'm not against the private sector at all. In that sense. Um, so basically, the private sector must respond to socially driven demand and ecological responsibility. And this is why, for what I would use tax, tax should be to um, re reclaim out of the economy more if too much money has gone into the economy, reclaim it out, but also to use it to punish people who are doing bad things with the resources, like environmental degradation, uh, but also to redistribute. Tax should be about redistribution. Um, and uh, so there's many uses there. So money is society. All money is a social contract. Whatever token is taken, it only can be made to happen if people acknowledge that um, uh, that it will be honoured. People know it will be honoured. I've, I've said this before. And pri the privatised money, what about this money purchase pension? By putting our, 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 our money into, I mean, not you, not you're too young, but uh, people who put their money into pensions and have gone into, into, into the private sector, they're about 40% down, so, so, so some, some, some people estimate, on what they would have been if they'd, if they'd been in the public sector. Because it, it looked good at one point. It was worse, was it? Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Don't, oh. So, but privatised privatize money, holding... You see, if I say how much bread do you need in the rest of your life, you should tell me. If I say how much money do you need for the rest of your life, you, you can't tell. And that's why people are greedy with their money. Because they don't know how much money... So even the rich, oh, I've got millions and billions and trillions. Have I got enough yet? Have I got enough? And, 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 and they don't know. They don't know. But if you, if you said your society will provide you with bread, then you know how much you need. Um, so money is no security in that sense at all. Um, now, my key point I want to get over, because of this deficit problem, and in fact we've all got to suffer the payoff of debt with those who owe, um, is that bad an analogies make bad policies. All the austerity economics we're being told now is driven by the analogy of the money of the country, but the state particularly, as a household. We've got to pay our way. Um, uh, a household couldn't live beyond its means. The much more correct analogy is not a household, but a babysitting circle, both well known to women, uh, and many men I'm sure, but men, and some of you won't have got quite to babysitting circles yet. But does any of you know the first thing you do when you set up a babysitting circle? You give out tokens. It is the issue of tokens per, per, per family that kicks it off. You don't just sit back there and wait for them to barter and somebody says, I've had a good idea. Why don't you invent a token? You don't do it that way around. You do it by issuing tokens first. And in any and, and this is why in any money system there must be an issuer who gives out money and doesn't ask for it back. Because if the state issues its money, or the bank issues its money, which it does, and asks for well, the banks are worse than ever, they ask for a hundred plus percent back. Um, the state when it issues money. If it asked for 100% back, there would be no money in the economy. That's why when we have our colonies, we tax heavily with only 60% of the money we gave out, because otherwise there would be no economy. So you must have a deficit if you're to have a money system. You must have a deficit. That is the lesson we have to learn. And, uh, and unless we understand how a babysitting circle works and understand that that is the best analogy, then we are always going to fall into this austerity trap and people are going to tell us these lies about the state or the country or the household. Um, the, the, where there is some truth in it is when you get to the borders and you start interacting with other economies and other currencies. And that, that is the analogy of the household is a 